Good morning, everybody, uh, and thank you for joining us. We are going to have a chat for the next little while, but I just want to celebrate the fact that none of us fell down those stairs coming up. Uh, <laughs> I, that was the thing I was most worried about today, so we have passed the first test. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us. We have a fascinating conversation over the next few minutes looking at what's next for live events. So we're all here in this beautiful arena. We are gathered together. We are bumping into each other. We're sharing coffees. But as we know, COVID shook everything up. It also accelerated a process that was already in train in terms of what's possible when it comes to virtual events. So you just heard uh, the names and the titles of the guests that I'm joined uh, here with today, but I wanna give you a bit more insight. So from movies and TV shows to apps, music, sports and gaming, Dolby transforms the science of sight and sound into spectacular audio and video experiences for billions around the world. You'll know the brands from Dolby Atmos, Dolby Vision, Dolby Cinema, and Dolby.io. Uh, Marie is the Senior Vice President of Dolby.io, and we're going to talk to her a little bit about what they do and how they are transforming the game. Alongside Marie, we have Todd Green, and uh, widely recognized by the developer community and used by over 2,000 customers worldwide, the PubNub platform for virtual spaces in, is the world's first developer platform that makes it easy and quick to build and deliver optimized real-time functionality in mobile, web, and IoT apps at scale. Uh, so guys, if we can jump in to this discussion straight away, um, Marie, if I could start with you, can you just explain, you know, are, are, how far away are we from getting immersive virtual experiences that are on par, if not better than, real life experiences? Well, I certainly can't say that we're there today. Uh -huh. I think that would be a bit disingenuous. But at Dolby, we do believe that uh, immersive virtual experiences can be as, as good or if not better in some cases than real life. because. When you don't think about a music concert that you might go to, when you're there, there's, a, there's some audio sweet spot and this fantastic view of the stage that a few people get to experience, but not everybody. But if you think about a virtual experience, there's the opportunity for everybody to have that. And we think, uh, but we don't think that just doing a good audio and video stream is going to be enough. So there are three things we think are important. One is immersion. The second is interactivity. And the third is social engagement. From the standpoint of immersion, we think this is critical from an audio and video perspective. And at Dolby, of course, we've worked with the music industry and uh, the movie industry. And so we think we know just a little bit about that. Interactivity is all about the, uh, the way that, you know, having really low delay so that the, the, the presenter or the performer and the audience can have a real interaction. That means like if you're presenting, that you can get a read from the audience and kind of feed off of their energy. You can be a more effective presenter and, uh, and you can even invite the audience to be on stage with you if you would like. In other words, you can swap them in and out. And that's an important part of live yeah. events, getting that buzz. So even the little joke about not falling down the stairs, hearing people laugh, getting their energy, yes. it does transform the work yes. that you're doing, whether you're talking, yes. singing, dancing, whatever, right? Yes. And, 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 and truly, like, the real time is, is key to that interactivity. And then, of course, if you're in the audience from a social engagement perspective, you want to enjoy whatever concert or, 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 or trade show or whatever that you're at, you want to enjoy it with your friends and the people around you. And that's another way to feed off the energy is from, uh, from the, those around you. Yeah. Yeah, and Todd, I just want to see, because although this is something that's emerging and there's innovation going on, this is not brand new. Sure, it's not. Like, this has been in the works yeah. for quite a while. Absolutely. It's, it's not brand new. Yeah, and, you know, it's funny asking this even this question, can immersive virtual experiences be better? We started the company PubNub 10 years ago, and our mission and our vision has been and continues to be, how can we make online experiences as good or better than the real world? Yeah. And when we started this 10 years ago, it was a very kind of eye brow raising sort of conversation. It wasn't right. something people really asked on stage. And it's been a spectrum of, you know, or, or I say incremental improvements over time, yes. right? We, when we started the company, we thought, well, there's a lot of ways to go attack this beast, right? We could 
build VR headsets. We're, we're not experts there. We could do the computer brain interaction like Elon Musk is doing or the Matrix. That wasn't also expertise. But one <laughs> thing that we did know was that we really understood networks and software infrastructure. And we said, until we can define and deliver the building blocks to allow everyone else to build these interactive experiences, we're not going to solve all of the creative aspects that are necessary to create, whether it's a VR or just browser-based or mobile-based, whatever that ex experience is, can we deliver the building blocks so that the rest of the world can focus on creativity and innovation as opposed to infrastructure? And that's been our mission for a while now. I just want to pick up briefly, you mentioned about VR headsets there a few yeah. times, right? People think that Web Summit 2028 is going to be all of us in our pajamas at home on the couch wearing a big heavy VR headset and interacting yeah. that way. That's not the only possible vision I, for the next iteration, no, I, right? I think, I mean, I think again, it's, it's, it's what everyone likes to talk about because it's sort of like dystopian and sexy and all of those different yeah. things. But the reality is, look, there's a small number of us who can afford to come here, that have the opportunity to come here, that are privileged right. enough to get on a plane and arrive at Web Summit. But there is a world of people out there that would be better off if they were able to have access to information, interact with other people. And it's not possible, and it's also not great for the planet that we all have to physically be in places. So it's not an either or, but if we're going to expose the rest of the world to you know, new ideas, to conversations, especially as kind of global, globalization starts to erode, I think the ability to have engaging and, and human experiences in a way that doesn't involve us having to physically be in the same room is going to be hugely beneficial. Again, if it's too hard to provide that experience, to build that software, to offer something that's immersive to the three things that Marie just talked yeah. about, you know, immersive, you know, interactive and, and, uh, social. and social, thank you, see I got those, um, <laughs> I think that, you know, I think that we're not going to have that. And so it's, it's, it's really up to everyone that builds software and right. builds experiences to be able to deliver that. But it's also not about the VR headset. Uh -huh. So I mean, I think, you know, I think there's about 15 million Oculus 2s or something that uh, Meta has sold now. But uh, I mean, there's billions of phones. And I think, I like to believe that these immersive, interactive, and social engagement experiences can be had with any kind of a screen, whether it's that or your phone and, yeah. some, uh, and some nice, you know, uh, right. you know, a nice, you know, some nice AirPods or something. It's not, it's not about just the VR headset. So, uh, and this could be a stupid question, so forgive me, right? But how much depends on hardware versus software versus the people in the background making the experiences good? Because the, even with a smartphone, there's a disparity between a $100 smartphone and a $1,500 smartphone. Should I still be able to get the same quality of experience, to, like regardless of what device I have? Actually, with game engine technology and a lot of when you talk about a virtual world, you're going to be talking about using game engine technology. They, they, today, actually, you don't have to have the high-end graphic card in your phone. You can have a great experience in a virtual world with what, what somebody might call a, a regular phone or something like that. Are there examples that we can look to in terms of what's being done in this space that's exciting and compelling yeah. and sort of the gold standard that we should strive for? Go ahead, you go okay. for it. So, so I am, of course, biased toward talking about music. And I think, uh, and so my first example here is going to be around something that happened back in 2020 on Fortnite. It's, it's, it was a concert by this artist called Travis Scott. It was called the Astronomical Concert. And it was, a, he was a huge avatar. They took, Fortnite took over his whole island. And it was seen by 45 million people over several performances. But it was like a huge... You know, in the pandemic, everything went virtual. Everything went online, and so all of the artists and the different and all the different uh, people like Fortnite, they were all scrambling to find a way to still get to the audience. And that was one example. I think, you know, another one is is this comp customer that we're working with. They're called Red Pill VR, and they create this virtual world experience that they call their electric garden dance club okay and you can go they use Dolby IO and the Unreal Engine and then you can go in and dance and listen to music and uh, they have like these 3d objects like they'll turn like the bass something into a, three, a 3d object that, that it, so it's, it's just really kind of wacky cool experience uh -huh. and tomorrow they have a uh, the UK's number one DJ Paul uh, Oakenfold I think his name is is actually opening a residency in Red Pill VR's space. It's like a virtual space, like yeah. you like to talk about. Yeah. Uh, actually, yeah, and uh, so a couple of things. First of all, 
my son was in middle school during COVID. He got me really into Fortnite. So I can, I'm, I'm pretty up there in the rankings now. So I had that experience. And when you Tones know. and I did her uh, online sort of experience with, with Fortnite, I went in. And, you know, I, I mean, develop, you know, development-wise, it was beautiful, a mixture of video and interactivity. Yeah. I found it really, really lonely. I was a bit depressed. Aww. As much as the music was nice and the sound, I mean, it was, it's still not... It's, it, yeah. it's not the same as going to see a concert, uh -huh. right? And I think that's still the kind of world we have to build toward. I would say, though, if, you know, if you're asking for examples that stand out, um, you know, all of those kind of future-looking, awesome sound, awesome video, great. But let's just think about the experience we had during COVID. Mm -hmm. And we love to complain about that, right? Being on Zoom all the time, uh, you know, sitting in our... It was terrible. But think about if COVID had hit 10 years prior, right, where the mobile phone was just coming out, not too many people had it. Uh, access right. to high speed, especially mobile internet, was really only in a few developed countries. And now think about 20 years ago, when the browser was just emerging and almost everyone had dial up. Imagine yeah. if we had had COVID only in the, in the brief period of time, that difference, yeah. right? Yeah. The ability for our children to go to school, our ability to work, our ability to do a lot of the things that we wanted to yeah. do, uh, really I think is, is, we're amazingly fortunate. And I would say so to me, like that, virt that showed us that if we have to, even with today's technology, we can, we can conduct our lives virtually. Not particularly in a happy way, but again, that's where, Marie kind of alluded to this, but we talk about PubNub as a platform for virtual spaces. And because we think of a virtual space as not just a VR headset, but, you know, a browser. You know, you could go to a NewYorkTimes.com and there could be 40,000 other people there reading the article. You have no idea they're at the same time. But if you can turn that web page into a space where there's some interactivity in some way, shape, or form, a digital whiteboard is interactive. Uh, an exercise yeah. bike with a screen on it where other people are racing is, is, is a virtual space and interactive, right? So for us, it's just a spectrum of you know, providing those building blocks so people can build those. The notion of the social interaction, I think, is very, very important. And uh, you alluded to it. You know, during COVID, I'm not a people person. I love yeah. being on my own, sitting in my room, <laughs> just on my own, you know. But after a while, I, I missed people. I missed being at live events like this. I miss right. being in my office. How does that authentic socialization translate into the virtual world? Because, you know, getting a thumbs up or getting a heart, like getting a, a tweet liked on Twitter is not the same as you coming up to me saying, good morning, how are you? So how do you yeah. bring that element of social, socialization and connectivity into this virtual space? You know, I, I don't have a perfect answer for that. I uh -huh. think there's a good psychology and sociology question there. I think what Dolby's doing is great just around you know, audio is such an important and overlooked part of that experience. We focus so much on video, but we have five senses. Some people believe even more, right? Yeah. And we're just focusing on that one visual sense. As a musician, like, audio has always been super important to me. I, I, so I'm going to hand it off yeah. to Marie no, here, so, but, so, so yeah. one of the key things for whether you're talking about the metaverse or virtual worlds or just these great immersive online experiences yeah is something called spatial audio. Mm -hmm. So that, so for example, imagine that you were back in like Fortnite or we're in Minecraft or right. Roblox or someplace and they're trying to put on a big concert. Well, you want to, you're there in your avatar, but as I walk up to you or I walk up to you, I want my voice, your voice to become uh, louder or, or softer as I go away. And I want there to be crowds around me and you really want these like complex crowded scenes so that the audience can self-organize, maybe your conversations overlap, but like it, you can really, you really feel like it's, it's a real life experience. Yeah. And, and, it's, and the spatial audio will make all the difference. I had a, an experience in the metaverse back home in Dublin and we were standing on a football field and I was at one end and I heard a voice in the distance of one of my colleagues. So I walked yeah. up and as I approached her, the yep. voice got louder. And it does trigger an emotional yep. response in your body when you hear that familiar yeah. voice. Also yeah. things like, you know, a sophisticated soundscape. So whether it is, you know, simulation of wind or leaves rustling. Layering of soundscapes. Soundscapes, in fact, this is when we're talking about immersion not needing to be a VR headset yeah. or something. Sat like we do this, we have some research around this at Dolby. The layers of soundscape can be absolutely transformative. I'm in the jungle, I'm under the ocean, right. I'm I'm you know in some crazy place yeah. like some crazy place. It's it's amazing what that sounds. I'm in a scary haunted house. I'm you know. Yep, and I think even to go further. I mean, look, as I said earlier, this is a this is a, a set of. Being able to provide the technology to as many creative individuals as possible, yeah. whether it's yeah. you know the real-time sort of synchronization and virtual space platform that we provide, whether it's audio, and, and let everyone else in the world build software that does it. Right. And but this is not new. I, I'm always shocked by this as a founder. You know, we started as this small company, 
Um, last month, we had over 500 million devices on the internet connect to PubNub on a, in a single month. We did over 3 trillion, I think 3.2 trillion real-time transactions or interact API calls to our, to our network. Um, there's a lot of interactivity in real-time happening today. Yes. And they range from the most basic things that have very little emotional connection, you know, just real-time information of who's in a room, to some really, really interesting things where we're seeing people interact on suicide prevention hotlines and more in, in, a, in a lot more... Um, really? Yeah, yeah. We, we actually, in a, in, in, for the last few years, actually, in a very... Um, compelling way that, that is actually making a difference in, in, in people's health and their lives and a whole bunch of other kind of experiences that might not be the same as sitting in a room, but again, give you access to a broader set of people who need help, who need education, that otherwise couldn't get it. Who or what is leading the way in this regard? You know, are there, because we, we've get, we had some examples there, but who are the ones to watch? And for the businesses in the audience today who are looking to somebody to either emulate or learn from, uh, are there groups that are, are leading the charge? Well, I like to talk about Roblox a lot because Roblox is really uh, uh, um, creating what they, we would call a creator economy. They've got millions of virtual world creators and they have 200 million active users. And so I think that they're somebody to look at and to watch. We have a customer called Improbable. And Probable builds their own virtual world platform, and then they help other people um, create uh, big virtual world experiences, like so, ten thousand people in the yep. in the audience. And we try; we're working with them, for example, to stream events out of their worlds to viewers. And the key here is it's on a phone, in a, or in a web browser. Mm. Um, Todd and I can both talk about the importance to developers. They don't want everything to be in some weird little bespoke piece of hardware. The web browser is key to democratizing and getting these virtual world, immersive virtual world experiences to everybody. Yeah, I just because yeah, I, I want to pick up on that briefly because that's the key thing, right? We, we can have fantastic technology that offers, you know, gold standard offering, but if it's not accessible and if every person in this room, for example, can't get it, yeah. it's going to be yeah. an elitist thing or it's going to be a segregated thing and create that digital divide, e e like make it even more than it already is. Well, I think this is a question, you know, if you go back to the early days of the browser, everyone was saying, how, how do we build really great software where I can book airline flights and you know, yeah. stuff that we just take for granted today. And then when mobile exploded, it was the same thing. How, do, how does the world take advantage of building these amazing mobile apps? And no one would believe probably today, you know, if you go back 10 years ago, that there would be millions of apps in the app store, right? And so you know, every time there's this new wave um, or demand by, by end users, there are software platforms that have to emerge. You yes. know, what, what, are, what are the standards? Eventually, there's something called a LAMP stack to build web apps and many others, right? And the same thing happened for mobile. And so like I said earlier, like our goal at PubNub has always been to figure out what are the core building blocks that you need for real-time engagement. We have literally been focused on this for 10 years, right? So whether it's you know, real-time communication through low-level messaging, whether it's yeah. presence detection, I want to know how many people are in this virtual room with me, whether it was doing you know, all these really buzzwordy terms like edge compute. Well, what does that really mean? You know, it's not just a buzzword. It means that you can actually yeah. do things at the edge so that as real-time interactions are happening, you can monitor, you can block bad users, you can translate languages, you can do machine learning on a bunch of other things that are happening in that virtual space. You know, we've, I think we've now, after 10 years, gotten to a place where Back to your earlier question, what are these, you know, who's leading the way? Every time we think we kind of understand the lay of the land when it mm -hmm. comes to categories of real-time experiences, yeah. something new comes up. You know, we powered the world's first digital fitness products. We're, well, that was a new thing. All of a sudden, no one knows the name of these old exercise bikes, and here's a new one that everyone knows the name of, right? Yeah. And then all of a sudden, it was the most obscure things. Like, we found out we were powering fueling at Heathrow and Dubai and other airports through this virtual experience where they're now doing real-time tracking of what's happening on the, on, the, on the airport field and letting people sort of communicate in, in chat rooms, which seems kind of mundane, but it's totally changed the way fueling happens. And now we're finding that we're, um, we're seeing huge growth in these metaverses and people actually getting millions and soon tens of millions of, of MAUs. I know that there's a lot of press recently that these, a lot of these metaverses are, are tumbleweeds, and that's yeah. probably true. But we're also seeing successes where people yeah. are building these great experiences. So every time we discover there's a new, there's a new category of yeah. things coming out there. And, and, there and, and it's around entertainment and games and whatnot, but it's also very much around business. And so there's, yep. a, there's a number of customers who are using, they're actually u using customer of ours, people, who are actually using game engines in order to create these virtual world experiences for a conference like Web Summit. Like, so 
you know, we have a customer called Metaverse. They could build an extension of Web Summit so that people who couldn't be here in person, because not everybody can be here in person, yeah. as you were saying earlier, so that they could potentially go and see sessions and whatnot and do it in their avatar uh, in, quote unquote, the Metaverse. You know, uh, sorry, no, I was going to say, just oh. remind me, the, the most immersive virtual experience I ever had was, not kidding, it was 1996, I think. Okay, <laughs> wow. And I was on a dial-up modem, and I was visiting my mother and showing her how to use a computer. And there was some virtual world that, I don't even remember the name of it, it probably went bankrupt a year or two later when they ran out of financing. But they had these big faces that were your avatars, and it was very low res. Mm -hmm. And yet, I was in this thing, and I, and I walked through, and I pulled out my guitar, and I started to play. And you know, the, my avatar's mouth opened, and everyone could hear guitar. And these other avatars started to, to crowd around. And then someone else who played guitar, their avatar kind of slowly came over, and very lo you know, low fidelity, you know, sort of you know, dial-up sound. He, he, was, he or she were playing their guitar, yeah. and it, we ended up having this little, little guitar off in this virtual space with a dial-up modem, super low res, and that was the coolest thing ever. So I, I, I just think there's so much more creativity we need to inject into these experiences. This is a though. brilliant point, and I want to yeah. follow up very briefly because I know we're up against the clock, but we're here at the Content Maker stage. There's a yes. lot of creative people here, not just on the tech side, but from the world of music or visual yeah. arts or video production. Does this present a great opportunity for creators who are looking to get involved and maybe provide soundscapes or get into the production side yes. of this world to ensure that they are availing of the brilliant Dolby technology or you know, to, to, to offer the best yeah. experiences possible to audiences around the world? Well, so each of the, each of the purveyors, if you, uh, if you will, of the metaverse is creating tools so that folks can do that. So that the musicians yeah. and the artists and anyone else who is uh, thinking of themselves as a game or something creator can build things. However, none of it is the same. And so I think one of the things that we have to do in the industry is figure out how we can potentially standardize and make it so that I mean, honestly, the promise of the metaverse is supposed to be that you can cross through all of these different virtual worlds and have experiences with people and enjoy your music or your art or your soundscapes or whatever by moving through them. And when all the tools are different, it makes it kind of hard. And that's, I think, I think that's what's really fantastic about what you do at PubNub is like in your, your you, and it's also the power of the API, is you're connecting it to all of these different places. Yeah, I think ultimately, it's, it's the creatives and artists that build experiences that are human, mm -hmm. right? And to Marie's point, like, it, it, it's sad to me a little bit today that if any of you, you know, decided to dedicate the next five years of your life building an amazing virtual experience, you would still have to spend six to nine months figuring out, well, what are the core technologies I need? Where are the platforms? Yes. And, and, and of course, the answer is PubNub. But seriously, <laughs> uh, you know, I think seriously, though, it, it's, it's not, the, the standards, it's not codified yet, which means right. that there's still restrictions in what a creative person can do. We just got an yeah. invitation, actually, at Dolby, I mean, literally today, to be part of this Metaverse Standards Committee with W3C and a bunch of the, yeah. so I think that that's where, that's the power of standards and that's the power of, but I also think that, one of the wonderful things about this world of software is it's whatever, these, whatever a developer can imagine, I really think can be made possible. Yep. And things like the pandemic pushed, really pushed us. And so now there's all kinds of ways that crea creatives can interact with one another. It's just, and build things that, that millions of people can potentially, or, or billions of people can enjoy. It's just, not all of it is as easy as yeah, we would yeah, want absolutely. it to be, right? Yeah. We are very near the end of our time. I suppose I want to end on an optimistic note. This is a big disruptor. It's going to change how things are done. Sometimes fear can come with change, yeah. but can you just kind of give us an optimistic message about the excitement and the potential and the possibility that is going to come from this evolution with this technologies? Go ahead. <laughs> well, I, I think, I think, so, I think that, the, that one of the most amazing things will be actually not just like this virtual world and the metaverse itself, but it's actually the hybrid experiences that we can build where you're both in person and you're connected uh, uh, through, you know, through some sort of a, of a second screen technology or whatever. And you could go to a sporting event, imagine going to a sporting event, but 
on your phone, you get to see all the different camera angles and you can follow your favorite football player around or you're at a music concert and you can, and you can in some, some way, you can uh, be much closer to different parts of the band than you would have if you did not have this like second screen capability. I also think to just, just this, uh, this, uh, this ability to like immerse yourself in new ways while being connected to your friends and meeting new people and networking and all that stuff, I think that's that's a, that's a key part and that's going to make a yeah. big difference. And, and I would say, look, I mean, there's going to be a lot of apps that suck, right? Just there are, right? <laughs> but I will say this, the average human being with internet connection in 2005 had more information at their fingertips than President Clinton did in 1995, right? right? Ten years earlier. And I think the fact that, you know, as the apps that don't suck are going to emerge and, 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 you know, in this very Darwinian way and get a lot of users and become really popular, it's going to change the experiences that people can have. And yes, there's going to be a lot of bumpiness along the way. There already is. There's a lot of negative press and some positive press. But ultimately, we're talking about the fact that, you know, our children and our children's children have a very different life experience. And a lot of it's going to be because a lot of the interactivity they have is not going to be in person. And so those experiences are going to be really crucial, I think, to how we evolve. And, and think about that generation. They're growing up with these game engines. Uh -huh. And so they're going to be well positioned to take advantage of all of this. It's the new normal, right? Uh, guys, thank you so much for joining us. A big round of applause for our two speakers. Enjoy the rest of Web Summit. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thanks a lot. All right. Thank you, Jess. Thanks,